um, this is. Yeah, um, that whole screen. Not, not a, or do you have them all included in one presentation? No, 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 okay. Then you must share the whole screen so that you don't lose the recording while. Share the screen. Yeah. Okay. Good. And I ring the there ring the bell so that people will come join us here. <laughs> Okay. How do you up and down. Excuse me. Yes. Three presentations open. This one. Yeah. This is this is your part. Yeah. Okay. But we need to tell the Stefan's part. Yes. Is there anything else on here, Stefan? Yeah. You go first, Steph. Yeah. I can the gesture of the arrows. Sorry? We will go to the next slide, which is the arrows. Yes, yeah, so uh, we can just up and down. Yeah, yeah up and down. Okay. In, in when it's your first screen, you can use it to write as well. If you think if I try. So. Actually, <laughs> 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 And last please, 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 this is the right. Yeah, so this is a certain five. Yeah, we do. So you're on the screen. Just the the wrong, the wrong, the wrong, the wrong, the the wrong, 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 so much more.
Deswegen zum Abhang. Ich Well, maybe we can start. I think we have we are like five minutes behind the schedule. And we have they told me they would be 50 people, but I can suppose they will be joined. <laughs> But they didn't change the yeah. might make it the research. Yeah. They didn't change the, the name of the session in the screen. There's no screen out there. I hope we realize it's this session. So well, thank you for choosing this session. Uh, uh, we are going to explain very briefly uh, the efforts or the, 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 the work that we are doing. Uh, together, a number of uh, European organizations under the umbrella of the Local Digital Twin Forum. Uh, and then uh, our colleagues uh, in Forum will try to provide a wide overview of some of the uh, different uh, initiatives and the panorama that we see uh, in the European scene. So, first of all, well, this is the, the introduction that we are we're going to have. Uh, uh, of my colleagues, uh, Stefan Ferro from NIMEC, uh, Ingrid Rocket also from NIMEC, and Josie Gill from uh, Chalmers will be presenting after this brief introduction. And then uh, we will have some time for, for brief question and answers or comments from the presentations and so on. So, what is the LDT Forum? Well, the LDT Forum started two years ago as an informal group of uh, organizations that are working in the field of uh, local digital twins, uh, urban digital twins. Uh, well, we mainly research organizations like uh, IMEC, Technalia, NIST, other organizations have been joining this two year uh, gap. Uh, I, I don't want to, to miss anyone. I have a list here, but uh, it's a long list. Uh, Tineo is uh, also here. The, the, the Digital Clean Competence Center, who is hosting the conference as well. Uh, I, I mentioned list as well. The Sophia University, the Gates Research Group uh, with, uh, with Chalmers and the Sophia University. And, uh, you know, other, other companies are, are part of the Digital Clean. So uh, this is an informal group that has been mainly started with academia and research, but has been enlarging also with industry. So mainly uh, what we have been doing during this time is to holding meetings and exchanging our experience, but not only also experience, but about also the, uh, the different approach, market approaches that we are having in our day-to-day -day work with cities, uh, uh, solving doubts or, or sharing uh, the successful success stories or use cases and also exploring common research topics and so on our ultimate goal uh, from the very beginning has to be has been to build uh, a common uh, understanding uh, not on the most uh, uh, general aspects of local digital twin but also going into the specifics of different aspects of development and implementation of local digital twins and how to reach uh, that our target audience, uh, uh, which are cities, uh, and how to yeah, act uh, as a group uh, in some sort of evangelist to uh, digital tweets for, for cities or for city planning. Uh, yesterday, we had our last meeting, and I think our first physical meetings, these two years have been uh, meetings, mainly online meetings, uh, quarterly meetings, but Yesterday, we had uh, the first physical meeting with uh, new people, new organizations on the table, uh, companies like Sweco, uh, the Digital Twin Hub from the UK, uh, the University of Twente, uh, 
I don't think I'm, I'm missing anyone. Uh, Rice as well from Sweden. Uh, and uh, yeah, I think we, it is time for us to step up and to yeah, fix more ambitious goals. Uh, like, yeah, possibly uh, building or, or, or putting on paper this common understanding that we are starting to, to agree. Uh, because as you can understand, it's not easy when 20 or, or, or more than 10 researchers start discussing about one complex topic such as uh, local digital things, which has different angles and different perspectives. Uh, well, reaching total agreement and total consensus is uh, uh, a titanic <laughs> task. So we are there, we are working on that, and uh, our, our great discussions are based around uh, how we can mm, uh, put all of this knowledge, all of this not, uh, common expertise into some format that can be then transferred to our target audience. Without further ado, uh, well, I will, I will, I think this is it for, for me as an introduction. Uh, and uh, I can go to the first presenter, which, as I as you mentioned before, Stefan from IMEC. Who is going to yeah? Who is going to give us an overview of the European panorama on local digital city? So, Stefan, thank you. Good afternoon, everybody. Um, I think in the title you see uh, lots of um, heavy words: eh? transformations, open, federated. Um, as a research institute, we are looking into that. Um, what are the things that can enable uh, these tra open federated transformations? Uh, I've, I, yesterday and today, I think uh, a lot of people talked about uh, a digital twin, a local digital twin is a process. Huh? Uh, process. Yeah, I come from industry, so for me, a process needs process owner. Process owner. And who will be the owner? Of that process, can there be multiple owners? Can these owners work together? Do they cover uh, parts of the sub processes? So these are kind of questions we would like to answer with the local district forum, or or at least contribute to that answer. Uh, I see also local districts as a journey. The same question can be put there: we, Who will be the guides on that journey? Uh, where can we look for if we are lost uh, on that way? So it's it's a lot of. Um, uh, complexity that's behind this time. Now, um, I'm here to talk a little bit uh, about what we learned in one of um, the transformative projects that explore this open and federation, which is called uh, which is called DUET, Digital Urban European Twins. It finished last year, and um, it was with all of these partners. So you see some of the partners that are here today and that also talked yesterday were part of that, and it was very interesting to learn about how these things can work together. So I will talk a little bit about that. Now, in a transformative, open, federated landscape, why do we do that? Why does Europe want to uh, um, fund that? It's, it's because it's all about inclusion. Right? Inclusion of uh, the smaller cities, the medium cities, the regions, and that they can learn from each other, that they can use each other's patterns and knowledge and tools to do that. So we will talk a little bit about that. So you see in the um, in the project, we had uh, a region, Flanders. By the way, I'm representing here also the project coordinator, which is Digital Flanders, which could not be here today. So I'm having the honor to replace them for that. Um, so it's a Flanders region, which has a certain um, maturity on, let's say, federation, semantics, sharing, open data, and so on. But we also have um, a city like Athens in Greece that contributed to that, uh, which was maybe uh, digitally uh, not yet into the game, but has a, a, a big size of a big city with the, the problems that are attached to that big city. And we also had Pilsen in Czechoslovakia, which already had a maturity on digital uh, twins, but wanted to explore further how it could uh, extend that in multiple more advanced use cases. So it was a very, very interesting fusion of parties together that wanted to learn about what this open and federate, federative landscape could mean. What is it for? So I'm going to share in a few slides some of the conclusions that came from that project. 
bit inspired with my own um, taste of that flavor. So uh, if we want to leverage local digital twins on a European level, I've summarized five kind of uh, things we need to look at, or that at least um, can accompany the um, stakeholders in the landscape towards that uh, goal. I say stakeholders because it's not only about the cities and the regions, it's also about the suppliers of the digital tools, the models, it's about the suppliers of the data, the owner of the data, it's a very cooperative field. So the first thing I will talk about is um, scope the ambitions and maturity on the road. Right? You have to know uh, if you want to participate in a process, you at least need to know what are your process parameters, where are you at this moment, where would you like to be? So we've collected some output of that. Um, the website is on the, was on the previous slide, where all this is written down. And we've classified a little bit the different uh, maturities so that at least you can have a position in that process. Second one is, if you have a process, you have a kind of vision, you want to go from one state to the other, uh, you have to build a roadmap uh, and you don't build roadmaps alone in that in this landscape, especially not from an inclusive uh, point of view. Huh? Not all the cities can build a roadmap on their own. They have to look at neighboring cities, at regions, at Europe and at an ecosystem. So we classified uh, the typology of local digital twins into four segments. Of course, these are simplifications, but at least it gives you some guidance in the process on the journey. The third part that was a big part of do it was to look at a level playing field through interoperability. We looked at uh, mostly technical interoperability. So I will introduce some aspects of that. And Ingrid will continue on what we also used of that knowledge inside the local digital twin toolbox architecture um, for the uh, future of middleware of digital twins. Uh, and the last, uh, the, the, the point four is we also Look at AI powered digital twins. What does that mean? Where does AI come in? We already touched that a little bit in the previous keynotes. And uh, what can we talk, talk about that? And last but not least, um, there is, the local digital twins are not a goal on themselves. They can feed uh, other, in, other uh, let's say, initiatives or visions of Europe. For example, uh, Europe is now looking at the Cityverse, which is using uh, augmented and virtual reality. Uh, that boosts on the local digital twins out there. Um, so that's also an important. So going quickly through the five uh, aspects. So we classified um, the digital twin maturity or ambition levels in four categories, starting from you first have to be uh, aware of what a digital twin is, what can it do for you, what is my maturity of my city. So we are still a company as a research institute uh, through digital twin innovation sprints of 10 days, cities to know what it means, what uh, uh, can it be, and can it be strategic for that city uh, or for that region? So it's a strategy phase. The second one is if you say yes, it can be a strategy, it can solve my problems, it brings value. Uh, what can we do? So you can start, we call that exploratory phase, you can start to do some experiments. There is data in your uh, domain. Uh, there are different data sets. You can take data sets from two domains, for example, the um, bus, the historical uh, track uh, records of or the movements of uh, public transport like buses. Can you use them to uh, maybe drive your intelligent traffic lights, your proof of concept of traffic lights? What could you do with urban planning? What can you learn from that? So you can experiment with some data sets and you can learn what you need to do with that data to make it digital and ready. How you have to make your data smart. What does it mean? So it's an experimental phase, and there are some uh, aspects on that. And the third one is the predictive twins. I think Teno gave a, a nice example of that this uh, morning. The predictive twins, they assume your data maturity is there, that you can connect to other data systems, to models of other players, that you have an ecosystem around that, and that you can um, use that in an insightful phase, right? so that you can really start modeling and that you can use these models and you can start predicting. And you could even uh, use that um, uh, in a multi-domain like uh, was shown this morning. And the last phase, uh, still a step further, is intelligent twins. And that's where, for example, AI comes in, where on top of these uh, levels of uh, the, the, the trajectory that you have run through, 
Can you, for example, uh, do reasoning on top of what you already have, on top of the models? Can um, your twin take autonomous decisions, yes or no? Huh? Um, I think there is not a lot of yet um, uh, actors in that phase, but it's good to have this kind of um, ambitions and maturity in your head so that you know who you have to partner with. Talking about partnerships, it's very important. Huh? We classified the digital twin um, types in four quadrants from the control, centralized, decentralized, and we're talking about federation, usage uh, in the government or in the ecosystem, uh, who is owning the usage of the twin. Yes, it's very important to also look at what type of digital twin are you ready for. Um, it's a lot still the case that digital twins are completely owned by the government because of um, all kinds of issues that could um, distill from that, from the fact that there are still prototypes being built, that the results are maybe not yet fully quantified. All of these things um, um, are reasons why, for example, there are lots of closed local digital twins yet, huh? uh, based on the purpose, the owner, the data type, type the data control, and there are some ex examples of cities doing that. But it's important to realize what you want to do, how you want to do it, uh, and there is nothing wrong with a closed digital twin if it uh, has the ambitions that you classified in your previous um, roadmap. So you can move from closed to network oriented so that you include some more ecosystem partners. Then you change um, uh, the, uh, some of the parameters there. Or you can go into more network enabled. Or in the end, you can go to network owned where your digital twin is not mastered anymore by your digital region or city. But that's the tool where the ownership is taken by the ecosystem. But everybody works together to um, unroll the local digital twin. Also uh, pays for the digital twin. That lots of value come from that. We're doing some projects, for example, now with Europe, uh, with, which, which are called testing and experimentation facilities, which want to boost AI models from TRL6 to, to 8. So all of this ecosystem can bring a lot of value in the city. But then you have to let the beast go uh, and you have to be able to manage that as a, an ecosystem. I, I, it's also, I think, something with the LDT forum that you would like to learn or contribute to. How can that work? Or, uh, what are the uh, risks and how can you deal with it? So the roadmap is important on the technical level. I think a lot of nice federation tools were already mentioned uh, in the previous keynotes. If I remember we talked about federation of ontologies, huh? the ontologies for multiple domains. How can you do that? Um, we talked about federation of uh, algorithmic results. Uh, I think uh, Bart gave some examples on that. How can that work? So we saw with CityGML that you can federate uh, information models, can federate that with uh, real-time data. It was also shown. So there are lots of tools up there that um, I think are usable in the architecture that we devised two, three years ago. So we called it our T-cell. It was just before the Corona period. So <laughs> it was a very applicable term where we had that vision that all of this federation should come from the fact that all of these digital twin components or subcomponents, they can work together in a defined way. And so visualization uh, components using CTGML can use the results of models that uh, have their own um, um, own place in the market, can use reference data, open data or not from the city, can use data from data suppliers, and all of these typical vendors have a speciality and that they can work together. So we have defined in the middle things like data catalogs, model catalogs, knowledge graphs, also mentioned in the previous uh, session, message brokers, interaction services, with some examples that I've, I've taken ex an example how to interact with models with a message broker, a data service. These kind of constructs are all on the web uh, page and we explore them uh, in real life. So with real use cases and pills and atoms and flounders, with real uh, products or uh, vendors delivering uh, models, for example, uh, TNO delivered some of the models here. Uh, we have visualization companies, commercial companies that were there that did the visualization using CTGML. And we try to abstract away how can we find abstraction APIs that make that possible without uh, killing the, the existing APIs that are there, but just embracing them and making sure that uh, that. Now, if you look at this, there are a lot of 
things there that resemble what they call today data spaces, which are hot in uh, in, in this uh, in this innovation landscape of Europe in the single digital market. So lots of these things are coming back in data spaces. And so uh, maybe Ingrid will show a little bit also how we reflected that in the local digital trend toolbox. So this is important. Uh, all of these ontologies that were uh, presented in the last session, they come back here. Uh, you can't do knowledge graphs without ontologies. So how do you blend them? We did not have time in this project to tackle all of these complexities, but um, they are the base of this to realize this. So that was about the technical stuff, AI powered. I want to dive a lot about uh, these things because it was already mentioned in the previous sessions. What can AI do? It was a question, I think, for digital twins. Well, it can help in the reasoning. Cognitive twins is a kind of trend um, for the future. It can help in user experience, not to forget that user experience is very important. Um, and it's not only for the algorithms that it can uh, boost uh, knowledge. Uh, but in a societal context, AI has been used a lot these days in industrial context and contained environments, and it's very successful. But in a societal context, it's still in its infancy. Uh, they talk about the third AI winter. There have already been two AI winters where AI was stopped by a lack of compute or a lack of data. So in a societal context, it could be a lack of transparency and trustworthiness that um, blocks the progress. So there are real, real, real threats to apply it on local digital tools. So these threats, there are solutions for that, but they need to be embraced. Um, federated intelligence, I think um, Amir talked about uh, agents. I think it's an important element, distributed knowledge graphs and agents on top of them to realize that. So all of these things are coming back and are, let's say, part of the engine of open and federated, federated power of local digital twins. And then the last slide, yeah, uh, Europe is already in the next stage. Um, so the city verse is coming. It's kind of the metaverse that was um, um, proposed, but uh, then for citizens, with, which is adding lots of these um, interactions with uh, businesses and, and citizens into the game. And they explicitly mentioned that this is only possible if you build on existing local digital twins. So um, it's even one of the KPIs. So all of these things that we are building need to be open and federated to support the next level of intentions. And I think that's one of the important aspects that we should um, not forget in this uh, landscape of transformative open federated twins. I think that was my presentation now by state and my time frame. Yeah. A bit longer than second <laughs> <laughs> Then we can go uh, further ado to the next presentation. I think uh, Stefan mentioned the LDT toolbox. Uh, well, do it, and European projects in general are one for that. The uh, European Commission is pushing for research in this area, but there is other initiative, specifically the, the toolbox, uh, and the Ingrid project is going to explain in a bit more or much more detail than I'm doing now. So, Ingrid. Okay, thank you for this uh, opportunity to present also the results of a very interesting, very challenging and very high speed project. We did a project for the design of the local digital twin toolbox for the project in only three months. Uh, but don't worry, following uh, elaboration on the project will uh, take some more time. So there are really some nice results to come out there. Uh, but I'll also start with the looking at, at the title of, our, uh, of the conference. Eh? bridging the gap between vision and reality. And I know we are all involved in digital twins and actually we're already running ahead, let's be honest. But if we look at the countries, um, we must see there must be a gap sometimes between small cities. I think what the hell is happening over there? Reality check is far away from what they see as uh, the challenges ahead. So. The, the gap indeed between how should I as a small city start on this local digital twin thing. Eh? Um, and that's also because maybe for us, we're already into all the, yeah, the, the uh, I would say architecture, but that's more technical, but also on, 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 on the value and on the purpose of, of things. Um, but 
for a lot of cities, the local digital twin is just one big, huge, immense project with a high complexity, uh, starting with data. And oh my God, I don't have data already. So how do I start um, from scratch? How do I have the funding? How do I get? Uh, how do I get started? And should I do it all by myself? I think that's also a very valid question. Uh, so that's why indeed the European Commission also. Um, is aware of that and says, okay, if we want to accelerate local digital twins, we should indeed give some tools uh, to these cities to accelerate um, their journey. And it's indeed a journey, it's a transformation journey. So that's why in their objective, they uh, define the project around the local digital twin. And the local digital twin should provide tools in a toolbox uh, that can be used as accelerators. Now, the project was defined in three phases. So this is uh, the first project that was uh, um, concluded uh, mid-August, and the results are also published on the AU publication site. So what I'm saying now will be indeed, let's say, uh, short takeaways, but if you want to you see more information, it's all out there published in some reports. Um, Currently, there is a second phase ongoing. So this is was about the design of the project, but I'll take you to some outcomes of that. And then currently, the second phase is already started, but that focuses more on really awareness. How, if we design a toolbox, how will it um, be adapted, adopted by cities, communities, how to make them aware what is needed to get it up and running. Um, also on the legal and technical sides, what can help procurement, uh, we know that Giving the fact that uh, moving ahead already, but thinking about systems of systems, we think it's important not to see it as one product that you will buy. So that it has an influence, of course, on how cities um, arrange their uh, procurement processes and whatever. And also about uh, deployment of enabling digital infrastructure. It's by the edit. So it's uh, enabling digital infrastructure consortium that will also be established by uh, the European government. And Last but not least, indeed, there will be a development of a first set of tools. Project um, proposals have been uh, sent out and it is expected to be started in, uh, let's say, about around April next year to really start the development of the toolbox. But now, first, uh, start with the beginning to design of the toolbox, how that, that project was established. The idea was to really start from what is needed what do they, people expect or stakeholders when designing a local digital twin toolbox and stakeholders, meaning that surveys have been done with cities, communities, regions, but also with industry partners, research institutions and standardization bodies, because they're all involved in all these nice fancy projects. Uh, but actually there are a lot of learnings as well that are not already aggregated. Uh, we have this lot of nice projects. Um, but they're not really aggregated uh, in the results or whatever. So that's why the project started with having a survey with important partners that have already contributed to a lot of projects. Uh, and then we uh, kind of classified, OK, what would the local digital twin toolbox look like? And then we used terminology, OK, what is needed? What are the capabilities that you expect from a local digital twin toolbox? So for the capabilities, you will recognize as well um, the basis of the local digital twin capabilities periodic table that was used by a digital twin consortium. We have technical capabilities, but for the toolbox itself, we added also non-technical capabilities like legal impact, um, but also uh, compliance and more strategic aspects. So, and the idea is based on the capabilities, we link them also to the ambition levels that Stefan explained to you later. So you can see whatever case you will be in as a new city or within the journey of your roadmap somewhere at a later stage, what will you need? And we translate it to building blocks um, that we can use as an aggregation level to develop some tools, guidelines, whatever, that are useful in the journey, transformation journey towards local digital twins. So that was the first step to really identify what is the parts of the local digital twin toolbox. And as I said, it's not just purely the technical things, but also placing them into the wider context of a city. The toolbox itself, the tools can be software tools. That's really an accelerator to know this is a tool that I can get guidance with uh, installation guides, whatever. Um, but it can also 
be non-technical uh, things. It can be best practices, can be use cases, can be roadmap instructions, templates for procurement, whatever. So that's the idea to have really a multi-scope toolbox to help you really in the journey to implementing local digital twins. Um, from the beginning stage of the maturity level towards intelligent twins, AI, whatever. So it will also be an evolving concept, of course. I'm eh? thinking about the AI and all of these things. These are also some guidelines that need to take into account that will have to have a place within the local digital team toolbox, everything that we will still be learning. Very important, principle, basic principle, technology and vendor agnostic. Just like the digital twin capabilities periodic table, uh, that was also a good uh, reference, let's say. Um, but of course, interoperable and reusable. I think that is key. Um, and the toolbox organization itself, it's not only just toolbox. Um, there are also some generic principles that are very important that have been defined within the project, but will also be taken up to the development of the toolbox and all projects ahead. So it starts from the communities, the cities and the communities, their requirements. So within the survey, we also identified user lists. So what is that they need? Um, and they will also contribute. So it is also uh, a co-creation modus. So all parties <coughs> will be involved in setting up the local digital twin toolbox. That's the concept. Uh, of course, led also by the EU priorities and values. So we, we also see the challenges cities are facing, it was also managed, uh, mentioned before, it will tackle, of course, the global challenges that we have around Green Deal and uh, other thematic uh, AU topics. Um, very important tools, software tools, open source based. So this is really why, why they want to develop, give the effort, saying, OK, we really want to deliver things open source. Um, that can be used as uh, being in an inter designed in an interoperable manner uh, for different purposes. And so it's all process. Eh? It's not just the toolbox, what is in there, but also the governance processes um, and the community building, eh? as I said, created by community and others. Um, so it must be self-sustainable. Now time runs fast uh, within this. So this is really a quick takeaway to the essence of well, the local digital twin toolbox. You recognize the triangle. Um, what is it? Of course, within the reference architecture to define these building blocks, it's, um, we see it's very important to take systems of systems and concepts as a basis. So uh, meaning that, for instance, on the data side, connect as much as possible to existing data platforms data spaces. So that's part of the local digital twin visualization, citizen participation should not be a fence, can be a quick app that also gives added value. Um, models, we believe there will be a, a, a model marketplace had to run down, but what do we need and how do we find building blocks to make sure that we connect to this other system? So that's in essence, and what basic core building blocks do you need to work together? So also, but interoperability, everything is MIM compliant, and that is also, of course, very important within the broader ecosystem. Um, if you see that there's a data space for sustainable communities and cities, they have defined already building blocks. You can look at the inventory, there are building blocks around, for instance, identity and access management. We also need it in local digital. We're not going to invent a new one. We connect to, uh, we, uh, we suggest that you use that building block. They're also MIM compliance, so it should fit. So that is what we mean with uh, the vertical interoperability, but also horizontal. If I want to have uh, an, uh, an asset registry, whether I use it in a big city or in a big region or national level, I could use the same type of components um, within context of city one, if I just context city two. I don't have time, sorry, to explain mm -hmm. this one, but that's not the objective either. But here you see, the building blocks that we defined, and there was a requested to make a selection to have real technical specification for a set of 18 building blocks. And what you see, what's important, we defined in the reference architecture the interactions between different building blocks. We refer to the capabilities they covered and we refer to standards, very important. 
all can also be industry standards that are really already existing. So you'll find that back uh, in the design uh, technical specifications. And that's also the input for the following project around the local digital twin development project. So this is real now, eh, because to be honest, our project was on paper, a uh, large paper, but a uh, big set of paper in a small period of time. But now the, the third project will result in a first set of open source tools that will be developed and will be tested in use cases demonstrated in six pilot cities. So I think this is a tangible result from the European Commission um, being used as a, within the perspective as accelerators um, to well also uh, share the common knowledge and the common experience also based from linking to existing European projects. Ideas also that other projects will use these tools as well. Researchers can use these tools, cities can use these tools, so it will be a very valuable asset, I think. And it all, of course, will link to the broader ecosystem. Yes, I think I've finished. <laughs> okay. Thank you. Thank you. Sorry for the other person, but I think you have been very successful in showing how the Commission is supporting uh, development in line with, with the ideas uh, that we as a forum are pushing, uh, that of uh, federated, open, interoperable digital twins, a uh, system of systems. You know, all of these points that we have been uh, hearing uh, from the from this morning. So let me jump to the next presentation. Uh, and last, but not least, we have been uh, data is the, the material with which we are building uh, the digital means now and in the future. And uh, I think that uh, more on, on data, on data spaces, on, on relationship between the twins and the data uh, is needed. And for this, George from Chalmers will be uh, giving the last presentation for today. I will try. George's time. So, in case you have any question afterwards, we will have time for that. George? Thank you. Um, I will definitely stick to the time also because so much has been said already. But coming last in this session, uh, I feel like everything has been covered. We'll see. Um, also, it was amazing to see how far IMEC has gone into actually the implementation or conceptualization of the technical details and the toolboxes. While I'm going to stay very much at the conceptual level, maybe going back to some of the what is open and what is this federated, what where do digital twins sit in this landscape? Um, so if we go back to, to where we started this morning, and this morning we started, what is digital twins? Um, we've seen a lot of examples, and, and we saw a lot of examples that start by producing these 3D uh, models. Um, but often what we were getting in the digital twin city center here at Chalmers was data related questions and questions like what we use it for. Can I have access to the data? What data does the digital twin have? So this sort of questions, a lot of it revolving around data. Um, and, and so the urban digital twin is not just a 3 city model. And it's really the expectation is to have many things related to data, as we've been hearing all day. Uh, having real-time data, historical data, access to data. Can we as a small company or we as a municipality have access uh, to the data about the, the entire city, the electric grid of the city, etc.? Uh, testing scenarios, integration across domains, we've heard all this. So I don't need, need to spend much time on these slides. But these are the real challenges that once we Yes, we have the 3D model. Great, here it is. Ah, can we get access to it? What can we do with it? So these are the sort of things we encountered. And so, yeah, the main questions are really related to data. And so what, what we have here at Chalmers is in one of the projects is actually we, we look under the, we have the nice 3D thing, the object, but we understood it's not about the object really. The digital twin is about what does it do? If we have the object and there's no motor, it doesn't go anywhere. So we have to look at it actually inside under the hood. That's what I look. So no fancy graphics or 3D models. Uh, and in, we have these data models for digital twins project running. And the idea is really to look at data models, but not to 
create data models. Again, going away from this centralized monolithic idea, but as a linking data models, there's so much out there. And the project is to propose extensible, semantic and linked data models open, uh, based on open standards and ontologies and to demonstrate that. So we are looking at it very much from the principles that are shared with the, uh, between the, the members of the local digital twin forum and how it, it has been presented um, uh, this morning. And as I said, I'm just going to show some very, very simple diagrams uh, uh, of how we conceptualize this idea. Because often we see the digital twin and, and we heard just before Thomas Cole was saying, oh, and the, the city has the 3D file. You download the file. And when I hear file, I shiver. I like databases. <laughs> uh, so conceiving a digital twin as a monolithic file, for me, doesn't work. Um, and so this is why I start by having a conceptual overview, really to open up people's minds to this federated and connected system. So if we look at the urban digital twin as the, the little object, the digital twin really does not exist isolated. It exists in an ecosystem because there's many data owners and many data domain experts that either use it or contribute to it. And what we need is not a, a monolithic centralized digital twin that absorbs all the data and becomes this thing that you download or that you run, but rather a more central and agile element in this ecosystem, in this network, the system of systems, as we've heard, that essentially orchestrates and coordinates both access to data, data owners, they own public agencies or even private companies, they own data that they about the city that can be accessed and they can be shared, um, but accessed by domain experts that need access to that data to do analytics, for example. So domain experts, they have applications, they have algorithms or models that run based on the data that comes from somewhere else. And, and vice versa, the, the arrows can be bidirectional. Be the results of a wind simulation can be accessed by another domain expert doing an urban plan that wants to check the environmental quality of uh, a certain area. So essentially, not looking at the digital twin as a single central uh, monolithic structure, but as an orchestrator. Earlier, we also heard about the data catalog. And it's almost like the digital twin has many roles. Yes, it's a visual interface, but also as a data catalog, data um, that identifies the, the, the various owners and, and um, the various data, uh, the content of the data, how it can be linked. So essentially, um, yes, I think I've said everything on that slide. <laughs> um, so essentially also that the digital twin does not have to store everything. And that's what I will show in the next few slides. Because that was in our center concern with our partners initially was, but do we have to give you all the data? Will the digital twin have all the data about all the cities? Um, where are you going to store all this stuff? Um, and, and there was a lot of resistance actually to, to just give away data. So. We need to think more on this federated um, way that there are um, there are transactions, there are brokers, there is access, and and there are rules to inter interact. So if we zoom into these little bubbles, um, the digital twin really is this element that has some analysis and simulation algorithms, maybe some inter interactive platform, um, but it has a conceptual layer that links all this data. So and this is the key thing. The, the landscape around it, this ecosystem, is about uh, open standards, as we agree. And um, the data that is this exchanged between these actors follows these open standards, whichever exists already. And the, the digital twin really just needs to link them together and has some capabilities, but does not have to have all the capabilities. Um, this is just data owners. They they. They can keep the data store in, in whatever form, but they just need to exchange it following open standards. But I wanted to get to the domain experts. The digital twin does not have to do everything because it lives in an ecosystem as where other domain experts have analysis and simulation capabilities and also their own data. 
that in turn they they can keep their internal processes and um, data models. They don't have to transform the way they work as long as they exchange data in a in a form that is understandable by others. So essentially, it's this ecosystem of data models, and the twin is a sort of an orchestrator that we we see the. the for them to exist in this uh, interact, inter interoperable uh, form. This is just another example if we think of uh, a domain of urban comfort where we have weather, vegetation and terrain that some expert knows how to simulate things based on this data. The results can also be sent back to the digital twin, can be used by a municipality, for example, to uh, make planning decisions based on uh, that data. So. Yes, it's a very simple, trying to in a very simple way um, show the, the federated nature and um, the interaction between these different uh, nodes of the uh, of the digital twin ecosystem. Um, for example, also crowd movement. These are just examples of how the interactions, transactions between the different uh, actors would operate. Um, and we've heard about data spaces. So essentially, this is already sort of being built. This is not just, um, um, uh, this is how essentially maps onto how data spaces are being uh, defined. And we have toolboxes and we have all these things already being uh, developed. The roles, the different roles of the data providers, data consumers, all, all this is already being specified. But a lot of people still don't understand how, what is the position of the digital twin in this? And that's why we felt the need to start conceptualizing uh, that role. Um, yeah, uh, I think this is, yeah, I've, I've said all this. So the digital twin, the urban digital twins can have the visual interface, but the most important thing uh, is really to start asking what is the purpose and adopt um, a federated and open, <clears throat> an open uh, architecture that connects to everything else, not just tries to centralize, uh, connects to other models, to other data uh, sources and other data owners, and uh, orchestrates this to, to, to exist in this ecosystem rather than a, um, a centralized um, uh, form. Yes, I think this summarizes what I wanted to share. I think I did. Yeah, <laughs> no, I did. Okay, thank you very much, Jeremy. And so this is the end of our presentation today. And uh, we have some extra time if we have to trust this plot here. We have almost 10 minutes for questions or comments, or maybe it's time for you to speak up and comment any, anything of what you have seen. Right. No questions? Yeah, I have a question. Um, on on, uh, on your, your presentation, uh, you get almost all the, the, the yellow, and the blue, and the green circuits, <laughs> and all the layer that's uh, say data access. Do you have any uh, solution for data access? That, that's the problem, because data access is all mostly called Really, Mary, or there are people that have to call them by phone and ask, "Hey, right now, no, it, it cannot be. It cannot be. I mean, for these things to exist, uh, you, you cannot be dealing with humans. It must be automated. Yeah. So we we must have automated I systems. Yes. 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 <laughs> Is there some, do you have a developer solution or do you can point out a solution that's in place? How to manage many-to-many -many communication about data? Because I haven't seen that. I'm really, really liking that. I think I might can step in yeah. because <laughs> you play up developing the toolboxes. Yeah. Yeah. Yes. <laughs> yeah, maybe I can try to, so data access is indeed um, a very cumbersome thing because it takes a month mostly to access data because you have to, Send mails to, you have to find who has the data, you have to send mails, you have to establish a contract, and discuss uh, the sharing conditions, the usage policies, all this kind of thing. So um, it's one of the problems that data spaces 
would like to tackle. Uh, it's uh, the slogan that we try to we do some research on how you can go from uh, data integration in months to data integration in minutes. And it's about lots of things. It's about, for example, verifiable credentials. Huh? You have to try to make templates on how you can define a kind of identity and access for a certain organization towards data in an automatic way so that you can issue that in what they call verifiable presentation. So it's about identity and access. It's about usage policies. If you want to make, uh, normally they are exchanged by lots of mails and human interactions, you would like to have smart contracts huh, where you explicitly define usage policies in a language, in, in um, the IDSA terminology, they use the open data rights language. It's a cement, you have to take it to a semantic level so that you can describe this data resource, which is in a data catalog, a federated data catalog. Um, these are the access rights. And these access rights are described in usage policies and they are not different than the usage policies that somebody else describes. So you, I, can, I can search in a data catalog based on usage policies that are semantically described. So I don't have to do all of these manual interactions because I can say, give me data that complies with this usage policy, blah, 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 and of that type, and I can find it automatically. And then the access, there are lots of access interfaces to do that. Huh? So there are European standards, there is linked data, there are Kafka. That's a matter of flavors, but you have to take the API-first approach to a data-first approach. And data spaces are trying to resolve that problem. It's not there automatically, but the key components and standards are there to automate it. So data access, I'm looking to data spaces to speed up the automation. That's going to try to set. <laughs> what, what is it? Yeah. What is it? Well, um, it's research. Yes. Yeah, <laughs> I'm, I'm a part of, of the architecture working group, for example, of IDSA. Um, the, there are lots of standards that are going to be adopted or um, candidates for adoption next year. For example, there is an abstraction layer on the uh, data space protocol, which is an abstraction on smart contracts, on marketplace access, on um, uh, data transfer, uh, data transactions. And they are going to try to uh, let that standardize by ISO. And it's important, these, these standardization trajectories, they are uh, uh, leverage for adoption. So the standardization agreements are there, the open source is there, it's evolving. So I think in the next years, we'll expect a lot of that. There is also a big tender of Europe, uh, simple the simple call, which is going to build middleware for data spaces. So open source software. So in the next year, a lot of things will happen. So I think 2027, they should be at scale. That's quite perfect. That's the advantage. Hopefully. Yeah, hopefully. Thank you, Stefan. I think there was some other question back there. It's, it's just maybe a little bit the next step now that we have the usage rights. Uh, I'm, I'm thinking of these ontologies, and I'm just trying to verify a little bit what's going on in my head, if that's correct. Uh, if I, I heard this morning that that's not way for standard, that's pragmatic and, and kind of translate or work with these ontologies. And then in my head, something starts where you go like, oh, there's these guys, I don't know, they produce bolts and they have a kilogram per square meters, blah, blah, blah. And, you know, go through all these kind of attributes and then you want to use it somewhere else. And when you have a long list of these attributes there, it's a lot of manual work in my mind. And then you have done this for these two. And then you go to a different company that also produces bolts and all of a sudden, their database looks so different. And then you start a little bit from scratch again. Is, is that really where we are? Or if I do, I have a wrong picture here. You know, I also have uh, some comments on that. So indeed, um, a lot of data is out there in a format that is not directly usable in a, let's say, federated landscape. Huh? Now, there are tools to transform the data towards ontologies and associated models that are out there. And I see different initiatives. We have, of course, we have lots of existing ontologies like the W3C uh, organization is providing the sensor things and all this kind of stuff. So there's lots of it out there already standardized. There are also initiatives to um, do that 
uh, more in an agile way, faster way, because we see lots of new data points coming out that are very interesting to solve problems, but they are not semantically defined. Uh, we see, for example, in Flanders, we have a, uh, the government has a process which is called Open Standards for Linked Organizations, where you can go to and you can work together with the domain stakeholders and they facilitate it and you come to a standard in six months for a certain problem. We have, uh, I think, Fiverr has a smart data models initiative. So there are lots of initiatives out there where you can pick and play. For me, the important thing, yeah, we are a lot, of, a lot in the linked data semantic web world. The most important thing as an organization is that you make it explicit. For example, an organization, I have new data. It has not been used before. It's never standardized. The only thing I have to do, I have to describe it in a semantic way and I have to add it on the internet. I just add a linked uh, URI where I describe my, my data. And then this URI is the base of, it travels with the data and you can just point to what it means. And it's officially, um, it's denoted by a unique identifier. And in the end, it doesn't matter so much um, if what is the semantics or the ontology is used, as long as you make it explicit and it's searchable and it follows, adheres to some standards. I think that's the federated pragmatic way how I see it. We don't have to wait always uh, until something happens. Just you as a data owner, you can make it explicit by some that's simple that's Yeah. And I was sorry, is this the right approach? I'm thinking a little bit like when we did the uh, language in try computers to make speed when we started the first with a grammar, computer grammar. It was a very manual process, different for different languages. Now, oh, let's take books, you have AI, and you run it, and it, it speaks just fine. I mean, are we going in that direction with these anthologies also, that, that in the end it becomes a massive data machine learning type of problem? Exactly, yeah. I think there are lots of promises there to use um, AI in facilitating semantic anchoring, let's call it like that, because you could, if you would like to make your semantics um, explicit, you can use AI to help you to do that. Um, and I hope there will be semantic facilitating models out there that you can apply on your own data set and that find out how uh, you should, what is the best way to make it uh, semantically explicit and uh, based on known experiences. The only thing you have to do then is make it explicit in your data catalog or uh, on the internet or I don't know what. So I'm sure there will be lots of AI assistance tools to help in semantics. Um, you've also got inheritance, classes. Yeah. Well, so you never start that curtain rod. Take one, inherit from the one you take, look for the differences in what you need that's different from that one and add that, and that becomes, becomes much quicker to get to your end point because you just, you just reuse it. And you don't have to do it all yourself. But you don't have to stick with what's already to go You convert it. That's what the inheritance is for. I just want to add, uh, but an important point that you raise or ask is that do we as data owners have to do anything? Of course, yes. It, uh, when I show this ecosystem, it's like as a data owner, you want to be in or out. <laughs> this notion of the data spaces is also about the marketplace. So um, and a lot of companies join it because they want to be part of it. They want to, they give access to their data also to get access to others in that market space ecosystem so that they can also together address higher level problems so if i have data on the road surface and someone has data on weather and someone has data on all of a sudden we can address more complex problems and even improve my own products with the intelligence i, I draw from the data so essentially it's either i want to be in the ecosystem i want to be a data owner that connects in the ecosystem i have to do this small step of yes I have to I have my own internal data structures, but I have to provide them that there I have this external access uh, layer. I have to decide on a standard, one, what, whichever ontology or standard to adopt. You don't have to invent something, but choose one. As soon as it's one from the open standards, there are ways to align and connect and uh, to others. But there is a, this little effort that is needed to be part of the ecosystem. I had a question for you, if, that, if that's all right. Yeah. So in your diagram, you missed a couple of things that I've oh, been I'm thinking sure. about. <laughs> and I'll talk a little bit about, but not, not 
as concise as you did. And, and that was um, data consumers. Yeah. And so you didn't have those. There's a lot no, of them. no. Those. And, I, and in my mind, there are two types of consumers. There's the end consumer who's just going to consume, but there's also the consumer who consumes in order to aggregate and then enrich and then and then provide a new service. Mm -hmm. And that chain of, of enrichment, if you like, was, was a yes. little bit missing from this. I, I was um, that domain expert, and it sort of encapsulates a lot of those things. I started thinking, who would be a, really just a consumer if we're talking about businesses, institutions, etc.? Maybe a citizen would be a consumer that does not put anything back. Most people get the data to do something with it, and potentially that creates value to give back. So that's why we have also those two arrows. Give back uh, or sell back. Or sell back. Yeah. When I say give, it's <laughs> to return something back into the system. But so the domain expert is very general. I actually was playing with those circles even this morning thinking, should I put data user or consumer here? No, I just said, no, good. let's keep it simple. Let's keep it simple. We have some people just own the data and they don't care what people do with it. Yeah cadastres and, and, and so on, they, they just own and create data. But people who use data also often also have data, give back data, they create new data sets indeed. But um, I, I oversimplify, if you look at the data spaces, there's a lot of different types of users, actors. So there's more, <clears throat> sorry, there's more types of actors, much many more. And maybe a step I have to do is to align more my, my terminology with that of the data spaces to make it um, more complete and compatible stuff in asking questions. Okay. Great. So we are like five minutes past the schedule, but I don't hear anything outside. So either the, the installation is very, very good <laughs> or the other sessions are at least as interesting as this one. So anyway, I want to thank you for attending this session. I hope you have some takeaways. We have learned how some projects, some Efforts funded by the European Union, be it horizon projects, be it uh, other initiatives, will contribute or are contributing to set, well, set, not set the foundations, but to advance or progress in how we need to understand the development and deployment of local digital twins. Uh, we have had a very interesting discussion on, on, on data, which is ultimately the material with which we build uh, local digital twins. Uh, so, yeah, I hope it has been interesting for you. I want to thank you again and enjoy the rest of the sessions. Thank you. Thank you. That's, yeah.